everyone. Welcome to Board Game Breakfast. My name is Chris Yee. I'll be your guest host for today. Uh, we're excited to be, be rolling back into another full week here at the Dice Tower. We'll talk about just how full this week is when we get to Dice Tower Productions. But to kick things off with this, uh, you know, with this nice early Monday, how about we start with a contest. That's right, we are giving away three copies of the game Trek 12, uh, USA only. Now this is a sponsorship for a game that will be released in October. So go ahead and uh, enter, but your the shipping the shipments won't go out until October. If you want to enter, email us at contest at dicetower.com. In the subject line, include the word Trek, T-R-E-K, Trek, and you have to answer a question, so you'll have to look at the. Uh, you'll have to look up this little blip, uh, blip of info right here. How many different game modes are included in Trek 12? And to tell you the truth, I don't know if it's 12 or not. But uh, look it up. Make sure to, to look that up yourself and find that out. So, excited to kick off breakfast today. I'm excited to be hosting again. Let's have. Uh, let's start it off with a couple contributors here, and then I'll be back. Stella and Tarrant from Maple University and the Dice Tower. So last time we talked about board gamers problems, which is not really a problem but still a problem for us. Now we've got another one. Karen. Yeah, expansion boxes and shelf space. I think that's always a always a challenge. Um, I like to because we have a lot of games, I like to get everything into the one box, even if it's a bit messy, even if the insert is gone, so that it all comes on one shelf. Very frustrating when it doesn't all fit in one box. Um, and it's just I, that what five percent? It just doesn't quite fit yet. Yeah. <laughs> and I know you're a bit of a completionist as well, and you don't necessarily like me throwing out inserts and uh, expansion boxes. I know, and I've already given up on that dream a while back, because when I bring back from convention sometimes i had to throw an insert anyway anyways it's a different problem yes continue it's all it's all part of the same problem yeah the problem which is ultimately the uh, cubic footage of calyx. board games <laughs> if we do it at calyx that's actually true um we grow a collection of board games and sometimes it's just not quite fit there's actually some rubber things that you can put around the board game Mm. Or some board games come with board game sleeves, which sometimes you can't even put the sleeve back in because of that. That's true. Has it happened to you? Let us know in the comment sections and we might come up with another one next week. And until next time, in the meantime, we are Meeple University on YouTube and on the Dice Tower. See you next time. Hello everyone, it's Clara and I hope everyone enjoyed the Summer Spectacular. Maybe you caught my top 10, I enjoyed making it and I really enjoyed chatting to people uh, during the live streams. It was so much fun and today's game actually came from inspiration from one of those chats I was in. They reminded me of the game called Hanabi. So for those that don't know, Hanabi is a fairly simple card game. There are five different colours and each of those colours, they have cards ranging from one to five. And the idea is that as a group, you want to play uh, each of those colours in order. So yellow, one, two, three, four, five. And you want to do that for all the colours. The only thing is that you've all got your own hand of ca cards, but you don't get to see which cards you're holding. You have to hold them in a way that everybody else can see them, but you can't. It's really good and fun game and um, I've played it a lot online with a bunch of my friends and it's fun but what is interesting is that <sighs> online in board game arena it remembers cards for you like it remembers the clues. Now I think that part of Hanabi is basically people forgetting what they've got and I have the worst memory so you think so the the age in terms of memory is is good but I sort of feel like it's not playing the game as it should be. Now also if you play online with strangers, there's all these extra rules that people have, like you have to give clues in this particular order. That's not the way I play it. I like to play it a little more, a little more organically without that preparation with my friends. So it's fun, it's a good implementation online, but I do really enjoy playing it in person with the cards, even if every so often you forget and you look at the cards and the games are passed. Let's be honest, it happens. I will say I don't own it. If I did buy it, I might buy the this big 
uh, ceramic block version, which is really pretty. But yeah, Hanabi, it's a great game. It's good online and it's even better in person. And until next time, take care and bye. Now, I noticed that the chat was saying that uh, there's a, a Clark Kent situation going on. Tom Vassell looks very different without his hat and with glasses on. I'm doing, I'm, I'm going bare uh, up here on, on camera to let you know that I am indeed Chris Yee. I don't know why taking off the glasses would help at all, because that's all you've ever seen me as. But I want to talk about a game from 30 years ago. 30 year, years ago, I was a wee little lad, and I didn't try this game until, honestly, just about five years ago. The game is called Clue the Great Museum Caper. This is a, uh, this is a hidden movement game where one player is the is the museum thief they're trying to steal precious pieces of artwork and up to i believe it's up to four other players are trying to catch said thief so the thief is invisible and they plan their own little pad of paper and they're riding around where they're moving on to and uh, there are security cameras that the other players can activate. The, the museum guards will activate security cameras to try and get a, a sense of a feel of where the hidden player is. And there's also a fun little uh, kind of a gamble. There's a lock mechanism where this museum doesn't have enough money to lock all the doors and windows. So you only get to lock half of them. So at the start of the game, the, the, uh, the guards will put all these tokens face down around the outside of the board and they will either be locks or they'll be just um, just kind of like a decoy piece. And so the burglar has a few interesting little ways to try and push their luck. The, the guards have a little interesting way of kind of creating this little lucky situation so that each setup is different. And uh, I, I really like this one. This is probably my favorite hidden movement game because I feel like it strips away a lot of the complications and a lot of the, the uh, there's no combat mechanism, there's no, it's not hidden movement plus a couple of other things. I found that this one actually works really, really well. It's, uh, it's not impossible to find a copy of. It's long, long been out of print, but I remember my, uh, one of my coworkers uh, back at the accounting firm I was working at was really excited. He picked this up on, on eBay or so for, you know, a, a, a decent amount, but not uh, exorbitant. And he, he brought it over, we played it, and had a lot of fun with this one. It's one that I we kept playing. We played multiple times that evening because it's that type of a fun game. I think that if you see one of these lying around somewhere, I know it says Clue on it, which uh, for a mass market game, I think Clue is actually pretty solid. But this one has very little to do with Clue. It was definitely one of those branding type things for a really solid little hidden movement game. So if you get a chance to play it, it is actually part of the Dice Tower Convention Library. So little plug there. I really like this one. If you uh, have found yourself wanting to enjoy hidden movement games more than you actually do, then I think this one might be a good one to check out. So that's the review from 30 years ago, the year 1991, I suppose. Math. Uh, let's jump over to some more contributors, and I'll be back. Hey everybody, it's Ryan from Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. Today I am talking about A Gentle Rain. This is from Mondo Games. It's essentially a tile laying game, but it's so much more than that. It is a therapy session in a box. It basically starts the whole thing off in the rule book by saying, get in comfortable clothing, play some relaxing music, grab a cup of uh, hot tea. Oh, my coaster came with it. And, and enjoy yourself and relax and enjoy this peaceful, cooperative tile laying game, which I loved. I thought that was a really fun uh, kind of intro to the game. The game itself is it's pretty straightforward. You're just playing tiles and trying to get combos in order to play these other little flower circles on there. But when it's all spread out on the table, it looks it looks gorgeous, and it is just very relaxing. You're just playing a tile, playing a tile, making these little patterns, making these shapes. Um, this is a, a game that I could actually solo. I don't solo a lot of games. I don't play a lot of games solo. But this is because of how simple this one is to jump in, set up, and tear down. Um, I actually try for it, and there's, there is scoring to it as well. The more of these flowers you're able to play, the better. And if you have even more tiles left over after you, if you've played all the flowers, there's additional scoring opportunities as well, so you can kind of rank yourself and see how you're doing. But again, it stresses in the rules, don't worry about the score. If, if you happen to be someone who likes to compare those things, go for it. But relax, relax, relax.
But because of that, I needed the best score. So, so far I'm at 14. We'll see if I can keep on doing better. All right, you guys, this is a fun one. It's super simple and it's, you know, obviously very portable as well. Something you can definitely play on a coffee table or an end table. All right, so yeah, A Gentle Rain. We liked it. Also, I want to point out that I taught this to our four-year-old, which in and of itself was pretty fun and cool. But Bethany and I, our work schedules were kind of weird. So I never got a chance to teach this to Bethany. Uh, our four-year-old was actually the one who ended up teaching it to her. So that was kind of a fun story. And she taught it right. Didn't miss any of the rules because it's so simple, which we appreciated. All right, you guys, if you want to hear more from us, we are Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. You can find us on YouTube or on Facebook. All right, everybody, I hope you have a happy and healthy breakfast. Bye. Hey, I'm Grant with Grant's Game Rex. Today, I would like to recommend one of my favorite card games out there, Silver. This is done by the same company that does Werewolf, One-Eyed Ultimate Werewolf, Werewords, and this game is like sort of loosely connected to the Werewolf theme, but not really that strongly. I mean, what's the theme here? Fun. Fun is the theme here. Werewolf, little bit fun, a lot. That's, that's why you're going to play this game, because it's fun. Why is it called silver? Well, it takes a silver bullet to kill a werewolf, but I don't know that that ever comes up in this game, so why is it called silver? Uh, silver is a element on the periodic table. It's not, not as valuable as gold, but people are still pretty happy to get it. In silver, each player starts the game with a row of five cards face down, and it is your goal to get the lowest number of cards in your row by the time a player decides to end the round. On your turn, you are simply going to draw a card. You can either discard that card and use the special ability on it, like that one says view any one card. So, okay, good to know that's 12. Now it's up to me to remember that that's a 12 there. Or I can also draw a card and then just replace a card sight unseen. You know what, I'm gonna replace this one. Ah, dang, I messed up. That one's, that one's higher. Oh, I blew it already. I like that there are 13 cards with special abilities in this game because it means there is some variability and strategy, but you're also gonna see the same cards multiple times. So it means that you can pick this up very easily. And I mean that both literally and figuratively. You can wrap your head around this game easily. It's also super light. You can pick it up really easily. You know, you can do this. If you're trying to work out doing this, you're not getting much of a workout. Sorry to sorry to tell you, this ain't this ain't doing it for you. So you might be asking, what's coming from the dice tower this week? Well, we've got a full schedule. We've got a very, very full schedule. Uh, right after this at 10 o'clock uh, Eastern Time, Z will be doing its What's Happening. Uh, Tom is scheduled to be back by noon for his Q&A. So if you're missing your daily dose of Tom Vassell, we're hoping that there'll be no delays in his, his return. Uh, but there's also going to be a, a Brian and Graham Anderson have a few reviews coming up this week. Uh, in addition to our regularly scheduled stuff, the Board Game Breakfast on Thursday, <clears throat> Tom doing five more great games with a special guest. Uh, Shoots and Marbles will be back tomorrow. And then uh, one of the things that... Let's see. Oh, that's right. There's a couple of reviews... You might not want to miss uh, a review, particularly of a game called Meadow. Uh, that'll be neat. Uh, Juicy Fruit is uh, another one, and then another one called Donut Dash. So some good, uh, some good food-themed games. But on Saturday, Stella and Taryn are going to be doing a live playthrough of Merv. Uh, on Friday, here at the studio, we'll be doing a live play of Kingdom 1183, and we'll be having the folks from Kingdom Games actually in the studio uh, helping out with that one. So that'll be very that'll be very neat. Uh, Sunday, we're going to be doing our Four Squares review of Summer Camp, which uh, is right up there on the on the wall, actually. Phil Walker Harding deck building game. Now, uh, briefly, I'm going to talk about the last few days as well because. Uh, we we had the uh, we had most of the last week off, but Friday we did our all day Q and A. So you can see Roy, Z, Mike, and me. Uh, we each did a one hour Q and A throughout the day on Friday. A couple of more shelf reviews went up. I did a review of Lisboa with my wife Wendy, uh, and then yesterday 
Tom put up his top 10 zoo games, and uh, uh, along with Ben Maddox, who had interviewed Elizabeth Hargrave. So if you want a really, really great uh, in-depth interview about game design, Ben Maddox has been doing his ongoing Design Note series. And so uh, every two weeks, you can expect to see a new interview up. Elizabeth Hargrave did a great job. Uh, and then you'll, you can expect to see even more big names like that in the coming weeks. So that's what's coming from the Dice Tower this week. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, I'm Tim. I'm Lizzie, and we are to play or not to play. We are continuing our look at holiday games. Games Ooh. that are small, pack in your bag, get on the plane, fly off. Today we are looking at Tides of Time. Yay. It's a game I really, really, really like. Yeah, so this is a great little game. It's actually a two-player only game, and it's unbelievably just 18 cards. Wow. Simple. I mean, it's 19. One of them's a reference card. But anyways, <laughs> the way the game plays, dead simple. You're um, making a little kingdom um, out of these 18 cards, and, and you do it in three rounds. Each round you've got five cards in your hand, and you select from those five cards one card to keep and you pass the others to the other player. And then you lay that card as part of your kingdom. And then obviously you've been passed the other set from the other player. You look at that four that you've got in your hand, take one, pass them back and so on. Very clever. Yeah, and you do that and lay them down. And the idea is that you're collecting sets because each card has a, a suit. So you're trying to collect suits and each card has an ability. And the ability is kind of like a bonus um, uh, mm. way of scoring and stuff mm. like that. So you have to try and get the sets and the abilities but the trick is, of Very course, tricky. you're you're swapping the cards with your partner there, or not partner, enemy. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, well, they're trying to build their kingdom, and their sets, and you both kind of want the same thing, and all the oh, it's just a nightmare game. The eighteen cards, very very clever. It's fantastic. You yeah. do that over three rounds, and the one with the best kingdom sets at the end wins. It's very very simple. Yeah. Um, yeah, really like this game, and obviously the fact that there's only eighteen cards fits in your backpack or your luggage very easily, and. If you don't like this theme, <laughs> there's this theme as well. If you like, like Cthulhu oh, theme. Oh, madness! Yeah, so again, same, pretty much the same game, but with little madness tokens. Great game. Z Garcia loves this so much, he gave it a seal of excellence. Ooh. Um, so anyway, there you go. Something you can take away on your holidays. How was your holiday? Oh, it's very nice. <laughs> no no for, men, it's great. Thanks for seeing us again. <laughs> Bye. Have a great breakfast. Bye. Well, one thing I wanted to mention really quick is a big thank you to all of our contributors, uh, those uh, during Board Game Breakfast, but also those who contributed as well during the Summer Spectacular. One thing I wanted to mention from the Dice Tower Productions is what we're going to start doing, and this is a bit of work, but we want to cut out uh, individual clips from the Summer Spectacular, so if you didn't watch the whole blocks live, you can see some of those contributor segments. So if you really appreciate Clara uh, or some of the other people who, who contribute regularly, you'll get to see some of the segments that they did. And uh, it, it is a lot of effort on our side, but we want to do that because the contributors do a great job. They make this show fantastic. They do things for the Summer Spectaculars, oh, all the Spectaculars that really help out. But it's time to hear what I think, what I think about. This segment was titled Let's make a deal. In, in a feat of irony, I decided to, uh, to, to choose that because I hate negotiation and trade in games. It's something I've known about myself for a while. I've, I've really tried, uh, I guess relatively speaking, not too many of them, but I've given several games a chance that involve a lot of trading cards back and forth. I think notably two of the biggest games that a lot of people uh, know from our board gaming hobby, Monopoly and the Settlers of Catan, utilize some form of, of trading and, and bartering and exchanging. And I've never been able to enjoy those aspects of those games. Ever since I was young, I, I, I suppose maybe stemming from the fact that I have a brother who's five years older than me, that you know, I never could really get a good grasp of what good and fair trades were in Monopoly or, uh, you know, yeah, essentially I got swindled constantly and then years later discovering Catan you know trying to trying to figure out like when do I need to trade three sheep for a wool or you know, for a brick and a wheat when is that you know advantage me instead of the other person I'm trading to anytime that someone in Catan says hey uh, I'm looking for XYZ resource I just kind of shut down a little bit because I don't have that bone in my body 
it's something that I've known about myself for, like I said, a while since getting back into the board gaming hobby or, or getting into it as, you know, as a more serious hobbyist. It's one of those things that spills over into my real life as well. I enjoy working in a spreadsheet, you know, as much as any person reasonably should. I enjoy uh, planning and building an engine. I like all of these things, and I tend to enjoy that type of stuff in real life, the planning and making a plan and seeing it, you know, seeing it through. But when it comes to bartering and, and negotiating and haggling prices, I am terrible. One of my worst experiences in my life is at a car dealership. I hated it. You know, there's all those sales tricks and, uh, and everything. Uh, I'm gonna slide this piece of paper your direction. I want you to write a number on it and slide it back to me. No! We're two human beings talking to each other face to face. We don't need to bring paper into this. Why? I hated every aspect of that. And so I know that this is maybe a shortcoming or a, or, or a, uh, uh, a spot in my gaming that it could be filled. I'm sure that there are really good trade and negotiation games out there, and I know that because I have an inherent dislike of them, I haven't explored the genre as much as perhaps I could. But why would I spend time trying to get better or trying to find enjoyment in something that I inherently dislike? But if you have any recommendations, if you have any thoughts on what games maybe someone who dislikes negotiation would like that has that, I'd be curious. I'd be curious to kind of uh, plumb the depths of the of the hive mind, if you will, the the watchers of the internet machine, and see what folks think, right? Because there are definitely games. Oh, oh this is a good um, social deduction game for people who hate social deduction. Some of those things exist. Is there anything like that for uh, trade bartering and negotiation? I'd like to hear your thoughts. But anyway, that's that's just what I think. Let's just jump over now to some more contributors. This is a segment where we take a look at a board game based on an IP, and I tell you if the IP and the mechanisms match or not. Today we're looking at Footloose, the party game. So let me show you a little bit how it plays, and I'll come back and tell you whether it fits together or not. The objective of the game is very easy. Have the most notes, the most points here from the notes. So everybody's going to get a player board like this, and they'll track the six rounds of the game. So when you're first playing it, what you're going to have is the high school that you're going to have here. What you're going to do is you're going to flip over the top card, and you can decide if you want to keep going. And it's just like 21. Uh, here is six. You don't uh, worry about the words on it just quite yet, but that's a six point. So what you're trying to do is get eight, nine, or ten without busting. So if I want to go again, four, six, eight. Now I could stop. If I were to stop, I would get the one note, and that would be like one victory point. If I wanted to keep going, so four, six, eight, nine, ten, eleven, I bust it, and then I wouldn't get anything for the turn. So the tractor chicken thing is, you know, I'm going to get a four, then the next person will draw. They got a two, then the next person will go with two. And then you can keep going, so I got six, and the next person will go, uh, it counts as one. This person will go, they would get six. And what you're trying to do is not get 11. If you get 11, then you're going to crash. So then the next person would go, just drawing one from the top of the deck, seven, eight, nine, it's not too bad. Uh, that's five, she's at six, and now she's got seven. So you continue to go. Um, once you crash, so here's 6, 7, 9, 12, I crash because 11 plus, then I'm out and I'm not going to win. Whoever wins the round will get the tractor, which is worth an additional four victory points. Well, they certainly nailed the feet thing. They really wanted to put feet into this because it's foot loose. They nailed that to a T. Everything else, I don't know if like this busting mechanic is going to work. And this kind of like pressure luck thing works with the movie. I don't really understand how that ties in or really much of what they're doing. The cards have feet on them, and there's that chicken game from the movie, I guess, where you guys bust differently instead of all at once. Everybody just takes turns doing it. Very bizarre. It's very bizarre this game was made. It's very bizarre they put foot loose on this game. The IP and the mechanisms match almost nothing. But if you want to cut loose, and you want to foot loose, and you don't want Kevin Bacon, this is the game for you. For everybody else, walk out of here very slowly and don't dance. That is possibly my favorite review I've ever heard for a board game ever. They certainly got the foot part of this game right. <laughs> All right. Well, looks like I will not be playing Footloose anytime soon. Uh, today, on the Chris Review's other, other stuff, other things, uh, I want to talk about a movie. I know Tom is probably going to talk about this in the future, but I'm here. I've co-opted the show. I'm going to talk about Black Widow. 
Black Widow, of course, is a is the uh, 700th movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, uh, and it was it was an enjoyable thing. We went and watched this actually as a, as a group, and. It was a fun experience to sit down, particularly to sit with, uh, this is when the guests were out for the Summer Spectacular, to hear Eric Summer during all the movie trailers. Every time he recognized what the movie was, he went, oh. <laughs> but the movie itself, Black Widow, how was it? You know, this is, uh, this is an unfortunate victim of a lot of the delays because of, of uh, the pandemic, the movie theaters being particularly hard hit. And so the timing of this film coming out is kind of strange. We sat in the theater and the Marvel intro rolled, dun, 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 you know, all the, the, the words come up and stuff. And I just sat there and I thought, there's a small part of me that wishes that this was Loki episode six. Because it just kind of came out right in the midst, you know, right about when that series was about to end. Uh, no, there will be no spoilers about Black Widow. But uh, the, no spoilers at all. Uh, but this was a fun movie, very action-packed. Uh, I, I really enjoyed Scarlett Johansson as this character in the past. But what I thought was was perhaps strange about this film is that that I enjoyed the character of Black Widow, but most of the other characters around her were more interesting. You know, the the um, the trailers show that she has a sister, and that sister is one of the most fun parts of the movie. Throughout, consistently enjoyable every scene that she's in. You know, if you if you've heard the term scene scene stealer, that's kind of what. That's kind of what happened here, and it's it's a it's a bit of a shame that you have a, a a title character like Black Widow who gets most of her scenes stolen because she's around all of these other very interesting, very fun uh, cast of people. I loved the dynamic of of this odd family thing, you know, this just trying to have these these people who are very uh, very strange and very odd all together, and you know, just to see. It's almost a fish out of water type thing, right? You you know Black Widow is this character for so long, and then you see just all these, you know, just sitting at a table with other people trying to have like this normal conversation. And you're like, oh, this is rough. She's not out there like zapping and tasering people and stuff. The the problem with this film, I think, is that there is a, there's a little bit of inconsistency when it comes to the action scenes. The action scenes really ramp up to eleven. And uh, as we, if we know anything from the Footloose game, ramping up to 11 is when you bust. And I think that's kind of the problem. Black Widow is a fantastic character. She's so cool. In 30 minutes of this film, she takes more hits and more, you know, just more damage than she has in the rest of the MCU combined. And she just kind of shakes it off. You know that, that, uh, that trope in an action movie where someone breaks their arm and they just like push your shoulder back into place or like oh god we're, let's keep going it's like that you know and so some of the actions a little pushes the envelope of believability a little bit too much you know uh, and of course this being a movie that takes place a little bit before um, Endgame because obviously you know people say oh that takes away the tension that takes away the the stress when you already know the character's going to survive well this movie the intro does a really good job of keeping a lot of that suspense strong but as the movie kind of went on i felt like uh, i've got a lot less suspense about whether people are going to come out unscathed because someone fell out of a 60-story building and was like oh pop that shoulder back in let's go so Anything that was, any scene in the movie that was character driven, where people are talking and trying to, you know, trying to figure out their relationship to each other and all these things, was so well done. I really liked it. And overall, I liked this film, but I, there were definitely laughable moments when it comes to, you know, uh, I think the sentence I've heard that describes this movie very well is Don't worry, the explosions will push the characters to safety. And that's kind of how I feel about the uh, the unevenness of the action parts. But overall, I would recommend Black Widow. And one of the things I really love about these MCU, the Marvel Cinematic Universe films, is that even when there's a film that, upon coming out of the theater, I didn't really love it, later films help tie in this, this story into a whole cohesive unit. And so I've always been able to come back to other Marvel films that I didn't love and appreciate their place in a larger arc and a larger scope of things. And so I, I remember doing that with, with honestly some of the some of the Marvel films that people liked a lot, rewatching them, 
I liked them even more. Some of the ones that I didn't love, I, I appreciated more. So I'm, I'm hopeful that as we get another three, four, five, seven, twelve movies into the MCU, I'll look back at Black Widow, maybe with a little bit more appreciation for what it introduced. As a standalone film, it was, it was okay and it was good. I still would recommend it. So that's my thoughts on Black Widow. Let's move on to our final contributors. everyone, it's Jen, the board game librarian, flipping some pages and pushing some cubes with my segment from the page to the table where I pair books and board games together and I have no snappy one-liner today. Sorry. Um, if you are me and you are of a certain age, you remember a TV show on PBS called Wishbone. I'm going to pause and you can figure out how old I am now. And I very clearly remember Wishbone's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And I remember having the book that went along with it. Um, but when I read the book, <laughs> the actual Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, I was a little disappointed because A, there was no Wishbone, and B, it was not as creepy as I wanted it to be. Like, if we have this epic story of good versus evil that resides in all of us and it was it's good it's a good book it's a very it's short first of all um and i think it's good for halloween time you know and yeah i i it, it's not wishbone i guess i shouldn't have had the wishbone book i'm sorry folks but i got that creepy feeling in unmatched cobble and fog such a fantastic system and they really amped up how awesome Unmatched is in Kabul and Fog. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, of course, are only, you know, one slash two um, parts of this game, but I think they're really exciting because when you are Dr. Jekyll, you can do certain things. And when you are Dr. Hyde, Mr. Hyde, you can do other things. And you're weakened of sorts when you are Mr. Hyde. Um, really exciting gameplay going on in this whole box um and i think this brings what the book couldn't necessarily bring um just that creepiness factor and just the artwork on the cards as well just continually outstanding from um the restoration of mondo team um that is all for this week friends happy breakfast All right, we're back at it talking 3D printing again today. I'm Brian Drake here on Board Game Breakfast. Today, though, we're going to take a step at the other side. So you've seen some of the machines we've talked about. We'll continue to talk about different types of machines. But before we go any further, we're going to talk about a topic today that is utmost important. I mean, you can have the machine, but you have to have the software to back it up. Now, the software, the good news, is free. It's totally free. And we're going to look at two different options today. Number one is called Prusa Slicer. That's if you want to use the FDM kind that prints out, you know, basically layers of plastic on top of each other. And then we're going to look at Chitu Box, which is the kind that were for the resin printing, which is what we've been showing the last couple of weeks where it flashes the light in the liquid and pulls it out, extrudes it piece by piece or layer by layer, I should say. So today we're going to look at both of those softwares. Just a quick overview and then we're going to come back next week or next time where we're going to talk about some different things such as supporting your models and things like that. So this is Chitu Box. This is a file for program for the resin printing and it lets you kind of zoom and skim. Now I have it on Mac, but it's available on PC as well. You can zoom and skim all over the place and see the actual 3D part. This is a piece of another lightsaber I'm putting together. Uh, you can change the scale with all these tools and we'll actually move it real quick and it'll, it'll move those supports. We'll talk about that in a minute. You can scale it and change it all the way up, way down. You can rotate it. You can make sure it's going to fit inside of your print bed and all such as that by checking this kind of stuff. Uh, anything red is outside. Another handy feature is adding supports right here. If you can do auto supports, which is what you need to really kind of get these heavier pieces to stay on, uh, it'll automatically support the piece. Obviously it's too big for the print bed, but we can size it again. And all of these supports will print, and especially at this angle, as it builds its way up, you can see how it's printing the, each one of these black lines you see as a layer. So it prints all the way up to the very top, and that is how you get this 3D printer done. So let's check the other type now. So this is the Prusa Slicer 2.3 right now. Again, you can scale around. This is a Tomorrowland Transit Authority. People move a car. I saw on Thingiverse, and we'll talk about where you get the files. Same kind of thing. It works a little bit differently. What I like about this file, that I, this program that I use for the other one that it doesn't have, is the slice feature. Let's say I need to put this piece in two pieces. So I'm going to slice it, keep the lower part. So there it is. I could have hit 
keep both parts and it will just put them here. So now we've got the piece sliced apart in case it doesn't quite fit on your print bed. Well, now you have two different pieces, one that you can print separately and then go back in and glue together later. So I love that for that feature alone. Similar, we'll talk about supports and stuff at another time, but this is the Prusa slicer here. So those are the two programs, a lot of meat on the bone here, obviously, and we'll continue to dive into that, how you can make the best out of the prints and ideas that you have coming up in the next few weeks. Have a good breakfast or brunch. You know what? Sometimes I like a good brunch. I feel pretentious at times and you know, I need some crabs on my eggs Benedict. I appreciate Brian Drake putting together this this very in-depth presentation, you know, as if it's, I mean, he's explaining Tron to me. And all I'm thinking about still is Wishbone, Wishbone. So yes, Wishbone, one of the best pieces of, of public broadcasting in the United States uh, that I have fond memories of that I'm not going to rewatch for the fear that the show doesn't hold up. That show needs to hold up in my memory. Maybe I'll introduce it to my kid uh, here in the future. But that, folks, is Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for joining in live. If you're watching this after the fact, remember to go back to the beginning with the details for the contest for Trek, tw uh, tr uh, Trek 12. If you are watching live here in a little less than half an hour, you can jump over to Z Garcia's What's Happening live stream. Thank you so much for coming by. My name is Chris Yee. Have fun breakfasting. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production.